Welcome, deer hunters, managers, and enthusiasts. This is Deer University, the podcast of the Mississippi State University Deer Lab. My name is Bronson Strickland. And I'm Steve Damaris. Bronson and I are professors of wildlife management and co-directors of the MSU Deer Lab. Together, we've researched deer across the United States for more than 40 years. In our podcasts, we explain the why and how of deer management based on science. Whether it's research we've conducted or explaining research done elsewhere, we'll offer you a college course in the science of deer management. But don't let Steve scare you. This isn't going to be a review of calculus or chemistry. Instead, we take results of research, reduce it to what's important, and explain how you can apply research to management. So join us for this episode of Deer University. Hey everyone, just a quick note before we get going with this podcast. Um, I recorded this with Donnie Drager uh, several weeks ago. If you uh, remember, I visited with Donnie Drager back in December, and that was the Culling podcast, or the, uh, I think we titled it Culling Factor Fallacy, or something like that. Um, But this is a visit with Donnie I recorded several weeks ago, and the topic is on supplemental feeding. And I wanted to provide this quick note before we jump in and get going, uh, simply because we had an audio problem during the recording, and it was on my end, my microphone. So uh, I wanted to apologize when you're listening to this. Um, The audio quality when I'm asking Donnie questions or commenting is a little distorted and a little uh, frustrating to listen to at times. So just bear with it. Luckily, I'm not uh, talking a bunch during the the interview. Uh, Donnie's doing most of the talking. So just wanted you to prepare yourself. I'm fully aware of the audio quality. I worked with some people to try to correct it, and this is about the best that we could do. So here you go. Without further ado, uh, this is Donnie Drager, and we are talking about supplemental feeding. Well, first off, thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. And I uh, had a good time with the culling one, and uh, we all had some, I think we had some good responses on that. And yeah, we sure did. Personally did. So, okay, so I get the question at hand here is why is South Texas kind of the bastion or the genesis of supplemental feed that is really kind of starting, to, we're starting to see the spread to the southeast and everywhere else. It, it's a multi folded question. Uh, I mean, sorry, answer that would be, that I'd say it has to do with, the amount of private land that Texas has, 97% and change. It has to do with the regulations that Texas Parks and Wildlife allows landowners and land managers. And then, to be more specific, why it probably started in South Texas more than anywhere else, it has to do with land holding size and has to do with landowners' ability to afford it. So you, you take an industry that, you take a, you know, Texans in general are always you know, one step, one, you know, everything's bigger in Texas. Well, you know, I think they took that antler uh, and, and that's the, the aspect of bigger antlers and ran with it as well. And they always wanted to push the envelope. Um, so I think it came out, you know, I remember a push in the early 90s for food plots. It was all the rage, all through the 90s. And what happened in South Texas is pe- lots of people tried food plots. But as we both know, and probably all of your listeners do too, t- you know, especially South Texas, and more, you know, the region I'm working in is a very arid and stochastic environment and, and very dry, and food plots just don't work. The, the irony of a food plot in South Texas is, is it works in the years you don't need it when it's yeah. raining, and it mm-hmm. absolutely fails in the years you really do. So it didn't take your average land manager, who was probably not a good farmer to begin with, and I put myself in that category, uh, because I attempted this back in those days too. It didn't take us long to fail at a few crops a few years and go, this is a waste of time, and and then kind of immediately say, you know what, there's this virgining industry of pelleted deer feed that I just, you know, it's all coming out of a bag at one point or another. So we just went, uh, we just immediately went that direction. And, you know, so I think that all of those influences at one time swirling in the melting pot kind of created the stew that we have today of a pretty heavily uh, fed areas in the state of Texas, if you're intensely managing deer, the odds are you're probably 
protein feeding uh, deer herd as well, at least in the state of Texas. Um, yeah, so that, that, that brings up one more question, Donnie. What in, um, I can always see uh, wanting to add a little bit more, want to sweeten the pot a little bit, and you could call it insurance. What is, um, what, where's the role of habitat management? Well, for us personally, I can speak on that. It, it's extremely important to us. I mean, one of the reasons that we're talking about the study that we're going to talk about today of the role of supplemental feed uh, along with deer density and how they affect each other is we wanted to know at what level does it begin to detrimentally affect the habitat. And that's, you know, where is that line? Is it a, and is it a relatively constant line? Is it a dynamic thing? You know, all those things. So it took 15 years for this study that we're, we're talking about to kind of come up with some really good answers on that. Um, and so I would think, you know, Texas has some really great uh, managers in, in the state, private biologists, state biologists, and then the state agencies provide some outstanding, terrific uh, direction with managed lands, deer permits, and these programs that you can enroll as a landowner, and they help you with that. And, and, and the basis for all of that is our land, is, is the health of the habitat, first and foremost. So... I think if you've moved over past, you move past a very black and white definitive line in my book that if you're saying, I'm, I want big deer and I'm willing to sacrifice the health of the habitat, then you've moved past, a, I wouldn't even call it a line in the sand, I'd call it permanent marker for me that I'm not willing to go. Mm -hmm. I, I think that I think that is that becomes into animal husbandry. It becomes into a whole other world of things that I'm not interested in. And uh, ultimately, I want to increase the health of the land and, and, and then have the byproduct of that be uh, trophy deer and, and quail herds and, and dove and all the turkey and all the other things that come with it, not just one keystone species. So tr true to the definition, you want you want habitat to support the deer herd. You want supplemental feeding to supplement. Yes, but that's where it gets tricky. So if you want deer herds to be affected by supplemental feed, it probably takes your deer herd, the average deer in your herd will probably consume more supplemental feed in the percentage of his diet than he will native vegetation. So this is where we get into this nebulous area of, are we going to call this um, supplemental feed still? Are we going to call it, uh, in, 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 in a sense, you still can't because some of our research shows that supplemental feed eases the pressure on uh, high quality uh, vegetation out there. So you can make an argument that if I'm supplemental feeding at an adequate level, and that's that we need to explore that, right? Mm -hmm. At an adequate level uh, that affects the herd, uh, then I may be actually helping my habitat at some level depending on my deer density. And 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 that so again I I'm speaking nebulously a little on purpose because that becomes what we discovered in South Texas for this particular thing is not applicable outside of Athens, Georgia. It's not even applicable outside of Austin, Texas, um, and and so forth and so on, because the environment we studied is very unique yeah. um, and, and, and driven by boom-bust cycles and rain to where these other ones may, may not have that influence. So... Uh, but it doesn't mean the premise of supplemental feed can't help your native vegetation. Um, and th and that's, that's an important concept that a lot of people don't get. But it's not as easy as, oh, I'm going to go open, put a feeder down, I'm going to pour it up, pour you know, a bag of feed in, and look, oh, great, I'm going to have forbs growing everywhere. I'm going to have my, you know, my oak trees, my white oaks, or whatever that you're... you're and Boone and Crockett bucks all of a sudden. Boone and running everywhere. You know, we are a long way from that. And this road is long and windy to get to from point A to point Z there. That, that, uh, and, and I'm happy to discuss all that, but it, I would dominate the conversation right now, and I think we ought to just take it step by step. All right, well, let's start with this. 
you can go uh, into as much detail as you want. Did you did you start with this? Did you learn it by trial and error? Um, so how much is enough? That was a note I jotted down. Because in my neck of the woods, I see that as the biggest misconception. So on your ranch, on a place where you have documented change, clearly you've documented change, what was the, the density and or rate at which you, which you were putting these feeders on the landscape? So if we're going to talk, I'm going to, let's, let's get down to the nuts and bolts of it, what everybody's interested in. Let's talk about Boone and Crockett score, right? So let's do it. We could talk about weights and hind leg lengths on fawns and birth weights and all that stuff that's affected pro- positively by protein feed. But everybody's going to fast forward and hit the fast forward button. until we How many inches of that? So what it comes down to, at, uh, we had a, about a feeder to every 175, 150 ballpark right in there for a relatively large area of the ranch. Um, and and that was uh, and then through the actually through a lot of the culling capture work that we that we talked about in the last episode um, that, uh, that we, we also gathered this data so we would capture in these areas that had protein feed and then we'd also capture in areas that had uh, not that had been unsupplemented or no protein completely native vegetation maybe a few corn feeders one to one two one thousand one to two thousand density you know certainly not affecting anything from a nutritional standpoint and what we found is that Boone and Crockett score can be positively affected by an adequate protein supply or supplementation program up to 12 to uh, I think it's 12 to 15 inches right in there so what does that mean that means that for simplicity's sake let's say a mature deer in the in the protein area will average 15 Boone and Crockett inches bigger than a mature deer in the unsupplemented area. For South Texas, I do not mm-hmm. want to extrapolate that outside of South Texas. Uh, do so at your own risk, but um, that's what we found. And then we replicated that again in the enclosure study that we did, the Comanche Faith Project, that mm-hmm. was uh, well documented. So uh, I think Comanche Faith... And it was, was a real similar number, yeah, if I it was remember. 14 on the dot, yeah. so it was right in there. I think mine you know, it varied from 12 to 15 over the years, but I think over 15 years, theirs was 14 inches averaging. So that's significant. That's a, that's a class and a half. for. Uh, and that, that, Donnie, you, you're only talking about mature bucks. Yes. Five and a half plus, yes. six yes. and a half plus. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And, and the reason, there's a lot of reasons for that, too. There is a hierarchical... Uh, uh, there's, there's this hierarchy of food chain, <laughs> literally, that is set up in a deer herd when it comes to a limited resource. And if you make that limited resource one water trough and 10,000 acres, well, it'll, it'll, it'll be a competitive situation. To, it, and, and supplemental feed is the same way. So if you have what we found in both studies, both my capture study, kind of more free ranging in the enclosure Comanche Faith study, Comanche Faith study, we found that the older the buck, really a buck starting about four years old and up, has just as much. They, they all have about equal chance so with with variation among uh, individual aggressiveness. Right? You know, you know some bucks that are just complete jerks and other ones are just mm-hmm. docile, right you know so the jerk is probably going to end bully. up eating more yeah he's a bully yeah. he's going to eat more than the docile and they may both be, be age seven years old uh now what happens at age three and down is those guys start lowering down on that totem pole that they get less and less protein uh from three two and one the yearlings and then the does are about equal to a yearling, maybe a little bit better than a yearling. And when I, I can give you real numbers here. So over the years, we did a stable isotope study with Dr. Dave Hewitt out of Caesar Clayburgh or Texas A&M Kingsville. You might need to define what that means. Okay, stable Not isotope. technically, but. <laughs> okay, so you know how uh, whenever they want to, car- you hear the term carbon date, right? So they want to carbon date this this. Uh, piece of um, wood that they found from the Viking ship somewhere in the world, right? Mm-hmm. They can, carbon-14 is a stable isotope. It means that it deteriorates at a certain state. And so they can run that through a, I think it's a spectrometer, infrospectrometer, I believe. And, uh, and, and, they, and they can date it because of this steady decay. Well, they can do that. We implanted certain, I think it was nitrogen-13 and carbon 
11 or carbon 12? It doesn't really matter, right? But those things we implanted into our protein feed. Specifically injected these type of material or a material that had that. Then we could take antler, hair, uh, and uh, blood and and uh, body tissue, just you know, uh, skin tissue. Uh, we took those four samples during these collection times during the capture, and each one of those gives you a little bit different window. But for the most part, we were looking at late summer to early spring kind of thing. That's when the captures were happening. Mm -hmm. uh, shortly thereafter is when the captures happened. And we found that bucks that were four years old and older on the on the Comanche were uh, were about sixty percent of their diet was protein feed. Sixty percent. Sixty percent. So now we That's go amazing. back into what I was talking about a while ago. Is that it gets a little nebulous? Is is sixty percent supplement? Well. Yeah. It's hard to say the true definition of supplement, but at the same time, that 60% may be helping my habitat during rough times or even during great times. That means when I get a good rain, my habitat's able to really kind of sprout and flourish and seed and go and reseed the next generation where maybe I, it wouldn't have done that without supplemental feed. So it gets a little, it gets a little weird in that yeah. sense. Now... You start backing that down the age classes, you go all the way down to yearlings, and they're like, I think they were less than 20%. They're like 17% of their diet was protein feed. Does, oh, you know, that's too low. I think it was around 20-something, and the does were around 30-something. And then fawns were non-existent, for, mainly because most of our, unfortunately, South Texas is inundated with feral hogs, so we had to we have a little small four-foot fence around our feeder site so the hogs don't eat us out of house and home. So the, the fawns just don't get it uh, for that. Uh, we, and we tested a few and they just didn't have it. So that's kind of the breakdown. Uh, so even at a level of 1 to 150, you're, yeah, you're feeding the four-year-olds and up, and you're positively affecting them, certainly, even at a herd level. And, but at the does, are you effect, at 30%, are we truly affecting their... We, we did show, yes, we are affecting their birth rates are higher. The, the, there is positivity there. But it always frustrates me as a manager. Frankly, I'm always trying to fix make a better mousetrap where I could get those does at a higher level mm -hmm. um, and do that and ultimately even the fawns and, and, and in an environment that has, you know, that's easy to do in Michigan, you know, where you don't have feral hogs. You know, so, uh, but not so easy to do in South Texas. But... Um, so you can see a graduated scale that the yearlings probably are being helped a little bit, but it, well, you know, an interesting side note, sorry, but as the culling went on, year one, the yearlings got, uh, there was a well-established age structure, year one, and then we went to two years of culling, and as you can imagine, those first two years of culling were very harsh on the adult bucks, mm -hmm. so we took out massive numbers of bucks, so uh, a mature deer, bucks that is, and what happened was there was there was no longer a suppression of the hierarchy of the older bucks were no longer there, or at least not in a strong enough numbers to suppress the does and the yearlings, and both does and yearling bucks went shot up like thirty five percent hmm. higher than it was. They were in the fifty uh, yeah let me see, fifty percent range of their diet, so they went from high twenty low thirties all the way up to high to into the fifty percent range twenty something percentage points let's say they went up all because that suppression was gone. Uh, it was a complete unintentional consequence mm -hmm. of what we were doing, and we were kind of lucky that we were doing all those things at the same time and to to see it. But to me, that just proved there was there was hierarchical suppression. Um, One thing, though, Donnie, you told me over the years, maybe this wasn't uniformly across the ranch, but on a lot of places, you you paired feeders mm -hmm. to hopefully address this issue. So essentially, now if you pair them, you have two dominant bucks at each, two bullies at each one, yeah. and you're still excluding those. And when you're running a deer herd like South Texas or like what we have, if you take all the five-year-old bucks and older versus all the four-year-old bucks and down, and just run sheer numbers, there's more five-year-old and up than there is four-year-old and down, and that's a proper age structure for a buck herd, especially in a stochastic environment when you can miss an entire fawn crop. So, 
Uh, Say that, Donnie. I don't think people will comprehend that. Say it one more time. Uh, okay, yeah, I said that a little too sciencey. Uh, especially in an, in an arid environment that is prone to droughts. When I get a horrible drought, and the prime example in South Texas was 2011, where my average fawn crop is about 65% average, and my fawn crop in 2011 was 12%. Mm-hmm. And um, and I know that not all twelve percent of those guys are going to make it till they're five or six or right. seven years old. So I basically just lost an entire age class. Mm-hmm. So um, as you do that, you know you get this stacking sort of method of of deer in the older age classes that that will be if you have a proper age structure, you should have more deer five years old and up than you do four years old yeah. and down. Um, for that you have to accumulate them because of the uncertainty of losing yeah. one to two cohorts. Yeah. So if you if you go through this and just say let's we we don't have we have a live for today in mentality and we're going to kill every deer that as he turns six or seven say it's seven years old we're going to kill every deer. First off, it's an impossibility, <clears throat> but just for the sake of argument, um, we're going to do that. Well, you're going to eventually run into that 2011 year old age class. And you're not going to have any, there's going to be nothing coming in from six to seven. You're just going to be, oh man, what happened? So the idea of letting some of them go at seven and eight and nine and hell, even 12, those guys get that old if, if, if left alone and, and good at habitat, they can get there. Not everyone, but you know, hmm. a certain percentage of them. Um, that's, that's where you've got this cushion through those, those periods of uh, poor fawn crops. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, so let's get to this. How long did it take mm. before you started seeing results? So I'm a deer hunter manager in Mississippi. I'm going to start me a supplemental feeding program. I'm going to go put out a feeder per 500 acres. Uh, yeah, for already, those I'm, that, not, I'm already on half the <laughs> but go ahead. You carry on. Um, <laughs> you know... I, I'm expecting within year one, I'm going to see some differences. Well, I in expect size. for you to be disappointed. Yeah, <laughs> is what I would say. So let's not even say expect. You know, I I, you are going to be disappointed. Right. Like, separate, let's look at the NFL. Right. The NFL players from the 1960s and 50s were minuscule compared to today. Why is that? It, it is because our nutrition as a country, as a globe, has gotten so much better and people have gotten bigger. And let's take the NFL out of it. Let's take the average height of a human being today on the planet versus 1920. You know, uh, it's the same thing. So what I'm saying is nutrition and high nutrition is a generational improvement. One of the big aha moments, epiphanies of my career as a graduate student was running across, uh, was it, uh, the car uh, is it? What was his first name? Vought, V O G T, right? Yeah. Uh, what's the first Fonts. name? Franz Vought. Franz Vought. Uh, his study pre World War II, II. pre World War II red deer, red yeah. tag, and study Roe. in in Germany, and mm-hmm. Roe. yeah, but uh, uh, and and that was just it opened my eyes so much to what nutrition can do and how it affects nutrition uh, and how it affects generation. So. To, to break this down for your viewers and listeners is that nutrition affects her, if done properly if done properly nutrition will positively affect herds over generational time what is the, the generation of a white-tailed deer is roughly five to eight years right six to eight let's call it somewhere in there so you can expect incremental increases over time over each generation will get a little bit better if and only if if you if, if you are adequately feeding the herd, one to five hundred, you are you are feeding a few individuals. You may positively impact those individuals' lives, but you're not positively impacting the herd, and so you're not going to increase things like. Uh, pond crops in general. Uh, mm-hmm. You're not going to increase birth weights. You're not going to increase the average Boone and Crockett score of your deer herd because you're only affecting individuals. So where is that line? So the next question there is that uh, where is that line? So i got to have X number of feeders per X, Y number of acres, right? Well, I don't, it depends on what you want to do. I mean, as I stated earlier, even at 1 to 150, your does 
and your young bucks aren't getting what I'd hope. I would want them to have more if you had mm-hmm. my, So I at had the most, 30% head. at that level. Uh, yeah, the, 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 those guys, those yeah. yearling and does, mm-hmm. yes. But the buck, the mature bucks are four years old and up. Man, they're 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 doing great. I mean, mm-hmm. I can't ask for more than sixty percent. You know, really. So, where is that line? That's at one to one fifty. I know a colleague of ours named Mark Bartakowitz did a study on chlorotetracycline that it, marking deer at, at gums, and he had it at one to four hundred. And he noticed what was interesting. Um, I, on our study, where it was at one to one fifty, it was three years old and up were all relatively the same. At one to four hundred, and I'm talking one feeder site to every four hundred acres, to be clear. And I, Comanche was one to one fifty. Um, Mark's study showed that it was four year olds and up were, um, and I may have been switching those back and forth here, but to be more definitive, right now. At three years old and up on the Comanche study, they're all eating about the same. It was statistically non-significant between the two. And but in Marks, it was four and up. So mm-hmm. what I just what I would take away from that is that my extra feeders got me one more year. Okay, one more year on pr- protein feed. I moved them down into the three-year-old age class to where they're getting significant amount. Um, and don't hang on before you interrupt me. Sorry, but the. Not to underemphasize the importance of 30% consumption of the does. It made an effect. It does positively affect them. Is it as good as 60? No, but it's better than nothing. And so the question, you know, this is going to be a cop-out to some extent, but when people ask me how much protein feed should I have, I, my answer is how much can you afford? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, really, you're going to be limited way b- on your wallet, way before you're limited by the deer hurt, way before you saturate a deer hurt, let's put it that way. Yeah. So that's my answer to the question. How much can you afford? And think of it aesthetically. How much do you want to see those protein feeders? How much do you want to, ha- logistically, can you handle your, your staff, handle and you fill them? And all these other things are going to be way more limiting than... Oh, I know at one to whatever the number is, I'm going to feed every deer on the place at an adequate level. The odds are you're going to run into a, an obstacle before you get to that point. Mm-hmm. So my, my suggestion is figure out a budget that you can live with. Figure out a logistical path, a pathway that you can keep them filled at all times, all year long, and do that. If you can't, and, and if you've gotten bitten off more than you can chew, back off of it. Do it a little bit less. Every little bit helps, but don't expect miracles. Um, certainly not early, and certainly not with just a handful of feeders across your place. Let, let me clarify one thing. I may have misunderstood. Okay. When, when you talked about um, the Bartoskowitz study using tetracycline to mark, yes. but that was, if I remember... That was looking at the proportion of bucks that fed at a feeder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Versus yeah, the true. proportion of their diet yeah, that came true. from. Yeah, that's a good distinction. You're right there. And I kind of confused those two. You're right. Yeah. So at 1 to 400, you may have touched most or all of the sure. mature bucks. Sure. But but also at that rate, you better be feeling filling the feeder every day, more or less. If you if you had all these bucks at that rate feeding on it, you're gonna go through some feed if they even went to it right. with any frequency. Yeah, I think I understand you there. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um <clears throat> you said something you uh, you were joking a little bit last night, but to, to put things in perspective, I uh, don't remember exactly how you said it, but it was something like, if you're supplementally feeding with bags, you're probably not having a big impact. <laughs> you're not doing it right. Uh, well, that's tongue-in-cheek, but because it can be done with bags. But the reality of it is, is all the... We buy tonnage. We buy, There's 18 wheeler loads coming for us, and it's all bulk. You know, there's bags in bulk. You get a better price with bulk than mm-hmm. new bags, first off. And and uh, it, it, it's a little tongue-in-cheek, but, yeah, I mean, it's, it, um, unfortunately, it may be true more often than not that if you're you're working with bag protein feed, you you probably aren't affecting the herd. You're maybe affecting individuals. 
Yeah. So so it, it's scale, a that's scale scale. issue. That's a, if you're doing this at the appropriate scale, scale. Yeah. to really affect a population, you're driving around with a few bags in the back of your truck, filling up a feeder every now and again. No. Not going to do it. No. Do you have a... Um, did you ever put any thought into feed quality? I, I know the first thing you did, you went shopping, and whichever bag had the biggest buck on it was... <laughs> If it had double drop tines, that's the brand. Well, that's really all you need to do. Oh, yeah, of I mean, course. It. It's the I same mean, way with food plot seeds. I don't know if you knew that or not. Yeah. We've had some, um, look, we were tied into the exact same feed for a very long time because of the culling study and because of the stable isotope stuff that I mentioned earlier, and we have just switched. I'm not going to endorse any feeds. I'm not going to mention any names, but what I did do is I took, I kind of talked to all my peers, what do you use, what do you use, what do you use? And we took, we started grabbing, there was one feed that interested me that several of my colleagues said, I'm really happy with it. And let's be, no no one's really doing a lot of scientific research on one feed versus the other. And there's obvious reasons you get hurt feelings and sued and lawsuits and all that stuff. So there's obvious reasons. But I did, it. I think one of the best things that, the, it was, I'm, I'm really happy with it. Let's put it that way. So what we did, we took the one I was interested in. We put it up against, we, we have this big food plot. But the food plot is low fenced. So anything can jump in. All the deer can jump in, but no hogs, no no javelinas. You know. um, so we put two identical feeders right 10 yards apart. And uh, identical feeders open at the de- exact amount of time the same day or open all the time. And we put our original feed that we've been feeding for 13, 15 years versus this new feed. And uh, the first test, they were about our feed kind of won. It was, it was really an, it's a, it's a, a disappearance rate is all we're looking at. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of call this a taste test, not mm-hmm. does it grow bigger antlers and all that. Hell, I have no way of knowing that. You know, you can look at the nutrients and the ingredients and you give that to a nutritionist, which I did. And he's like, yeah, it looks good to me. And, you know, but he can't look at one label any more than the next guy and say that that one grows bigger antlers than that one. That's first off, that's an impossibility. The best nutritionist in the world will not do that, cannot do that. And so, therefore, the whole feed industry is a little nebulous to start with. I'm using that word a lot today. But nonetheless. So what I did is a taste test with feed. And I figured the more they eat, the better off we are, right? That's We kind of helped prove that with the Comanche Face Study. And uh, so... We did that after the, and we ran at least every one twice. And to shorten this up, we did it on our feed, and then the first one, our feed won. The second one, the the uh, the other feed, the new feed won. And then we did it one more time. The new feed blew our feed out of the water. It was like they ate the new feed almost all the way gone, and our old feeder that they'd been eating for 13 years was like 80 percent full. Wow. Like, okay, you lose. So we let them eat that all the way down. We kept the other one empty. So now both are empty. And now we brought in the new feed. Let's call it type feed A. And versus feed B, it beat feed B, you know, in two trial tests. And then it, we did it in feed C. It beat feed C. It beat feed D. We did five or six of them. I can't remember how many. And it beat all of them hands down. I mean, one of them was like we had to bucket out the feed in, in like t- type C, whatever, we had to get in there and bucket it out because after 45 days of the other feeder being empty, the type A that we liked, or the new feed that we liked being empty, they still wouldn't, they wouldn't all of it. type C. So we had to bucket it out and kick that one out of the program and went on to the next one. So there is there is definitely a, a some preferential taste differences in deer feed. This one I can tell you was has heavy peanuts and some soybean um, but shoot heck a lot of them do so mm-hmm. I'm not going to narrow it down any past that um, but it is uh, I feel good about it because I think our consumption sh- should and maybe could go up now that's good and bad as, as from a biologist standpoint I'm excited about that from my landowner standpoint the guy who pays the bills eh, he's yeah. excited but he's like dang that's going to ding the budget even it's more gonna ding the budget's going to suck out the wallet and just so it's all these give and takes it comes down to how much can I afford okay know? well okay so on that note um, as 
you have said, we have said in the past, you're in a very different special environment. And so you and others, of course, recommend if you're really going to have impact doing this, the scale at which you have to do it, and you're doing it year-round, and you're doing it year after year, it is constant. Yeah. I've heard some of your colleagues say, if a deer goes to a feeder, it better find feed. Yeah. Plain and simple, yeah. you know, or just or, or don't do it. Um, let's not even use Mississippi as an example. Use somewhere you've been in the past, maybe in the Midwest or something. Um, so let's say you have a boom and bust environment with food. Let's say you're in an ag region, and for four months out of the year, there's more soybean, alfalfa, whatever, than a deer can eat. Um, but during the winter time, it, it can be tough. Very little food on the landscape. In that context, could you say you would only need to feed maybe starting when crops were harvested? Yeah, I think that's a great example of that. And I think the first thing I would do as a land manager coming into a situation like that, or a deer hunter, is I'd I talk to my local biologist. I talk to my bio, my state biologist, and say, "What are the weak times? What are the times that my the deer in this region need help?" And if I can't feed all year long, for economic reasons or for even you know uh, maybe there's hunting uh, issues that you can't do it over. There's some regulations on that. So if I can't do that, then I'm going to do it under under the appropriate times. Now <clears throat> you can affect where that gets complicated is is the times of year you feed can affect different things. I mean, if you feed during the winter, you're probably affecting survivability and post-rut buck mortality and things like that. But you're, And then you quit, let's say, February 15th, you're probably not affecting antler growth. You know, you're, you're, but if you start at February 15th and feed till August, or relatively in there, you, you're probably affecting uh, antler growth more than you are certainly winter survivability. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, again, if that's the best, if that's what your budget allows, yeah, pick pick a cycle, so to speak, and go for it and do what you can. It's better than not. But don't, um, you know, the expectations have to be tempered in, the, in those circumstances. Know why you're feeding. And what and if you're going to feed during a certain season, then know why you're doing it. And, and learn through if your state agencies, your extension people, et cetera, learn how that's going to affect your deer herd. Um, if you have an, you know, I think that uh, I think that that is as good an example as you can get from a from a seasonal uh, uh, supplemental program. I mean, mm -hmm. you set it up there. I, I agree with that. Okay. Um, the ranch you manage is hunted. Yeah, it better be. Uh, <laughs> uh, ranch owners and, and friends, etc. They want to kill bucks. Yes. Are there any impacts to feeding during deer season and sightability? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we do. <laughs> yeah, there is. Uh, as our supplemental feed program got really up and running, let's say by year five or six into it, we really started noticing that our bucks kept getting harder and harder to hunt, and they began to eat more and more at night. And, I mean, it didn't matter if it was 80 degrees outside or 20 degrees outside, you know. They would just, and and, we, then, then, and then you co correlate, I mean, combine that with the timeline of the, the uh, really the, uh, explosion of trail cameras. You know, the most, we went through a period there where we were so frustrated that, uh, you know, you'd hunt a certain area and it may or may not have a protein feeder near it and then, and you'd, you know, deer didn't show up that you're hunting. You go back the next day, you look at pictures, and the son of a gun was there 10 minutes after you left after dark, you know, and, as it hit dark. And you're like, man, this, and it started happening enough. We started, like, this might be a pattern. So for us, we, we help engineer a certain, uh, I, I got myself involved with a few feed companies, or I'm sorry, feeder companies, and we created a, a feeder that, will shut at night if we want it to. So mm -hmm. during the hunting season, we'll shut our feeders at night. They, they roll up at dark, uh, th well, th you know, uh, right at dark and right at sunrise, they open up during the hunting season. So I have protein feed technically available ad libitum, or free choice, during daylight hours during the hunting season. But 
right about now, even before the hunting season is finishes in Texas, which is the end of February for MLDP, um, they uh, we uh, we start opening that up twenty four seven, and and so the rest of the year, the spring, summer, early fall, it's twenty four seven, always open, truly free choice, um, but. Yeah, that's a good question. By the way, that's a uh, that is a if you're adequately feeding a, a herd, they they can adapt to where um, I don't need to stand out in front of your your deer blind and eat corn when I've got all this protein to eat at night. For I don't have to go on the food plot or I don't have to forage in the woods. Right. I, I've got all the, the right. And so be aware of that. So that, that is a very good another point. unintended consequence. Yeah, unintended consequence. A side effect. However you want to put it. Yeah. Um, Donnie, what else before we before we wrap up here? How about um, let me deal with this because people are going to wonder about this. I, obviously, I'm not I'm not in any way, shape, or form putting you on the spot about your specific situation. If there's any way to do so, can you give somebody an idea of? Man, if you've got let's let's just say big for my neck of the woods, small for your neck of the woods. Let's say you got a five thousand acre property. You're gonna really get in. We're, you know, boys, we're gonna jump in. We're gonna do the supplemental feeding. Do you have a number? It's like, guys, you need to be prepared for X, give or take. I see you have whipped out the calculator. So <laughs> oh, yeah. So are you asking me, what are you asking me, a number of what? Okay, so let's say if, uh, you know, Donnie, I don't know if we can go a, a feeder per 100, but if we're going to go to at least a feeder per 200 acres, and we're going to do it the South Texas way, we're going to run this thing year-round, what what are we looking at at cost? Ooh. Well, what is feed is roughly... Uh, it, 20% protein feed can go anywhere from 3, let's call the cheap end is 340, 330 a ton, all the way to around maybe over, uh, in the high end, maybe 400 a ton. Um, one of the things that we used to do, what was it that I always said, it's three pounds per deer per day, right, on supplemental feed. So if you want to get some rough numbers on what you're going to be able to, what, what you, if you know, take your survey, spotlight, whatever you're doing, right? Um, your census, camera, whatever. Take that number of deer and times it times by three pounds per deer per day, times 365, and that, and then go find out what your local deer feed would get you in bulk or bag or whatever way you want to do it. And there's your there's your estimate. And and the odds are you'll get the final number while you're sitting down, so you don't collapse and hurt yourself. <laughs> Because uh, it, you'll then fall out of the chair. Yeah, this yeah. is like there's nothing cheap about protein feed. I mean, there's not the, the feeders aren't cheap. Adequate good feeders aren't cheap. The the you know if you have hogs, you're fencing now. Um, the protein feed is there, there's labor, there's equipment to move it, there's barn storage, there's there's overhead bins. This is a you know it's the gift that keeps on taking. You know it just but at the end. It is proven. It is absolutely proven to grow bigger deer. So, where are you going to put your money? If that if that's where you want to put your money, great. You know, and, and I think you know. I'm going to make a statement, and maybe I'm wrong, and you correct me if I'm wrong. I think you have. I think protein feed is more needed in, let's say, South Texas, or maybe the Hill Country of Texas, or Florida let's say, northern Florida, than it is, let's say, in these areas of the southeast that have adequate rainfall, that can grow great food plots, that you are well-managed, your forestry plan. I think if you do all these other things right, and then for God's sakes, just let your deer get old, four, five, six, eight years old, right? Those, those guys, you're probably better off than spending hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years on protein feed and by the way protein feed doesn't do a damn bit of good if you i don't care how much you buy if you still shoot him at three he's still going to be relatively small you know so you have these other bigger things to deal with in my opinion so let's let 
stop finding the silver bullet. Stop finding that one thing. It's not about that. It's this holistic approach to the land that says I have to burn at the right time. I have to clear cut or select cut or food plot and by God, let them go. You know, mm-hmm. let those young deer go. And the odds are, if you're in this vast region from Louisiana to the Carolinas, right? The odds are you you don't need it. I need it in South Texas for a couple of different reasons. First off, it just doesn't rain some years. <laughs> right? It just doesn't <laughs> appreciate rain. that fact. It doesn't rain. No. You it, can't grow plants when it doesn't rain. I get 10 inches <laughs> a year sometimes. A year. Yeah. You know? And that's it. You guys get that in a day. <laughs> so... If it doesn't yeah. rain, things don't grow. So we have we have a stronger dependency on protein feed. Now, Texans always are the first ones to rave about how great we are, so we're probably infecting the rest of the nation with this protein feed thing, uh, this protein feed agenda, if you will. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, but don't buy into it if you're at this you're at this prime habitat of southern Georgia or the Delta of Mississippi, don't buy into that. Go manage. And mm-hmm. it's way more fun and probably way more satisfactory. And, and it's more efficient. It's more yeah, cost effective. It's way cheaper. Way cheaper. And and it, it, so there's the there's the direction I would take. That's the, you know, we're, because we're in this unique environment, we get some advantages because of it. But there are some real disadvantages to that uniqueness of the western South Texas. Um, that I mean, you guys get fawn crops. You're so dependable. I'm so jealous that, oh, yeah, we had a bad year. It was a 78% fawn crop. They're like, oh, my God. <laughs> Please, you know? And that's the, you know, the, those those statements bug me because uh, those are great years for me. So, yeah. um, well, people are going to think I wrote a script and held it in front of you and said, read this. <laughs> But, and I promise you there's no script. That did not happen. I knew I was hitting some good points because you did get happy in a lot of headshots. I, I, I probably but, started yeah. smiling because <laughs> I have. I did it just the other night. To be honest of, with you, I've never really had that. I've never had this conversation with somebody, and it kind of was just an epiphany in, in the moment mm-hmm. of how let's not infect the world with protein feed. We don't have to do that. You know, yeah. it's it's a good tool. Uh, but it doesn't mean that. You, yeah. you, hey, hey, everybody that's listening, go out and run and go buy some bags of protein. It, it's that's a it. tool when you need that tool, right? But if you're in, in my neck of the woods, you can do foot uh, make yeah. let's much say you, stronger. Hey, let's go to the other end of the. I mean, let's go to the far ends of it. Let's say you've done all the things that we just laid out, and and and, and you, the odds are you're probably getting some pretty big deer in there. But you now want to push the envelope. And you can afford it. And you can get afford it. Feed, buddy. Mm-hmm. Go get it. And you will see an improvement. It'll jump up even on more on that. But if only if you do it right. You do it consistent. But uh, it, so it is. Uh, but that's going to be 0.001% of your. Oh, of ab- your audience. absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, I've actually gotten to where, Donnie, um, I think. Um, I worry about people being taken advantage of. In the protein well, world. Being marketed yeah. to. Well, one reason I'm not mentioning names, I was in, in this whole protein, I think it's, look, I don't care. I think it's a bed of thieves. I think that there's, they always come up with the new magic ingredient, you know, this blah, blah, blah. I won't even mention magic ingredients because I don't want to implicate anybody in that. But there's, it's so exhausting. And then, I'm fortunate to have a good relationship with a nutritionist at a university, and I go, hey, what's the story on this magic ingredient? Mm-hmm. I, yeah. He goes, no, there's no effect on that. you know. But they'll market it like it's the greatest thing. Oh, we finally unlocked the, we've unlocked the box. We've got yep. it, guys. Here it is. Don't buy into that. It's an overall good nutritional plan. It's higher carbohydrates. It's higher energy. It's higher protein. Um, it, you know, that's it. You know, and, and, for me, I wanted to find the one that deer would eat the most of. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm in a very rare, fortunate situation that allows us to say, yeah, we want deer to eat more. Um, uh, the other night, during a program, I, I said this and uh, got a few chuckles, but so it's very similar. It's deer management's diet pill. <laughs> it, it's 
That's I mean, you right. think of the similar, the, the, the marketing and the bag, and if you feed this with what you said, this magic bean, it's this ingredient, and, yeah. and voila, you've got it. Yeah. And it's the same thing with I'm going to pop well, this bowl and lose 20 pounds. Well, yeah. I'd say there's a difference. The difference is protein really works. Your diet pill probably doesn't. Uh, you know, it, 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 protein really works, but it works well at a level. The, the that, special ingredient that they're saying I is in it, this. Yeah, I see what you're yeah. yeah, but I don't want to, people to be confused. That protein yeah, yeah. does work. Well, protein it's scientifically proven that. Yeah, do protein. protein. It's sure. If it works, but at what cost to your average hunter is? I don't think they're willing to go that route. Certainly, when you can make the same 12, 15 inch leaps with just solid habitat management and yeah. deer management and you know you make a hell of a lot of leaps if you just shoot them when they're six or seven well a, a number we throw around a lot is just think about this that a, a typical food plot let's just say you're uh and you were able to, to have it year round i mean you, you can grow five plus thousand pounds of food mm. per acre Right. On these food plots, that's a lot of feed. Yes, and 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 you start doing that on a sustainable basis with cool season and warm season plots on your property, and then if you can manage the habitat, and then you can burn. There, there's very few places. There's no place I've ever been in the southeast where I thought um, they they are doing everything they can do to manage the habitat and or food plots. Yet. I think they need supplemental feed. Yeah, you never, I've, I've never that scenario. I've never seen where they're maximizing what I think is the lower hanging fruit. Right. Yeah. But I bet a lot of the people that you're talking about or uh, still wanted to hear about how can we, you know, what how, help us implement yeah. supplemental feed. And it's like, hey, help me spend my money unnecessarily is another way yeah. to put that. And, and and I get what you're saying. And and it's a little bit for me being from Texas. I, I'm, they may run me out of the state for this whole conversation for this, but we'll we'll see. Uh, but you know, so it's it's. I feel weird saying it because, but it's true. I, I don't want to mislead people in the areas that that, that probably are the majority of your listeners are, are mm-hmm. in the southeast compared to South Texas. So, um, if you're in South Texas. And you can afford it, yeah, go for it. If you're in the southeast and you're the the unicorn that's done everything else, then go for it. And sure. you can afford it, go for it. But the odds are your your unicorn is just a horse with a, a cow horn. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not really a unicorn. So uh, let's 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 call the baby ugly yeah. and get down to work. Yeah, go go to work on your habitat. Mm-hmm. All right, buddy. I have checked all the questions and comments off my list. Great. Anything else? So let me wrap up. Let, let me, let that one little sound bite there. Mature bucks, after a decade, let's put that in perspective, after about a decade of feeding, and there's an acclimation period of getting deer to using and eating the feed, mature bucks, on the average, gained about 15 inches. Yeah, with an adequate feeding program, with a significant herd-wise feeding program. Yes. Okay. And um, and so going back to the example you gave earlier, uh, someone that's considering this is going to have to think of, if I'm going to have that impact, I'm going to have to consider uh, a program that is going to have a feeder, I would say at least a feeder per 200 acres, and most of the year you're going to have to have feed in it and you just have to put a pencil to paper and think about is that cost which is going to be 10 at the minimum tens of thousands of dollars after the infrastructure of buying the the feeders and all that is an, an average increase of 15 inches worth it and there's some people that absolutely it's worth it there's some people that won't be right yeah. Right. And, and just as important, there's other, in, in a vast, large area of the country, of whitetail country, there's other ways to get that 15 inches that doesn't require supplemental feet, and that's just better. Like action. shooting spikes. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, down the rabbit hole. No, mm -hmm. no, don't shoot spikes. Mm -hmm. uh, just go do habitat management and listen to your manage age structure. Yeah, find manage the habitat. Do what I do. Find people smarter than you and listen to them. Listen to them. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Donnie. Thanks a bunch. All right, thank you. Appreciate man. it. We're glad you joined us today and hope you learned something valuable about deer management. If you have questions about this podcast or a question about a topic we haven't discussed, please log on to msudeerlab.com, click on the Deer University tab, and send us your questions. We'll get to them as soon as possible. In closing, we want to thank our employers, the Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. We also want to thank the St. John and Dudley Hutchinson families for their endowments that support deer research and education. Music